Hey, welcome to the show. Today, my guest is Jim Newman, who is a non-duality speaker. Talks a lot about non-duality and does it in a different way than a lot of people out there who are talking about non-duality. And um, just to dip into my past a little bit, how I found Jim is I was an ardent seeker for a while there, doing lots of practice, lots of inquiry. And at some point in time, a few months back, it dawned on me that this student-teacher relationship was sort of perpetuating the sense of separation. And at that point, I was kind of without a man without a country, so to speak. And I had an interview with Anna Brown, who had been through, through something similar. And she mentioned um, Tony Parsons and Jim Newman as being really good people to listen to. So I checked out Tony, and I didn't quite click with Tony, but then I saw your videos and for one reason or another just resonated so deeply that I watched every single video you've got out there and I'm re-watching a lot <laughs> at this point and no idea. It's just one of those things that's out of my control, but the I've been having glimpses of what's being pointed to in the talks, I guess. Mm. And it's been really, really cool. And I think that that message you deliver is so unique in a way. Um, I thought maybe a good way to start this would be for you to do an introduction because I know you've done hundreds of introductions and I've seen a lot of them and no two are alike. They're all mm. different, even though the message is the same, but yeah. hearing it put in different ways over and over again just seems to really resonate with me and bring up this, yes, thank you. A lot of yeah. gratitude for this message. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Okay, so... um. So what we what we talk about, <clears throat> or what this discussion will be about, is um, is that what's arising or what's appearing or this is all there is. It it is the beginning and end. So this doesn't actually have a reality behind it, nor does it have a reality within it. It's simply an appearance. And in that, or as that. It's already without need. There is no longing intrinsically present within the appearance itself. There is, however, a need that arises in bodies like these. And that need we generally call me, I am, or the person, the self. And that, that need arises as an experience of separation. The experience of separation is is well, it begins or arises out of a contracted energy and that arising is a centered knowingness of the appearance, which is completely illusory. And that centered knowingness then goes on a journey called my life of trying to find endless more knowing. It's basically all I'm looking for. Enough is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for enough and all I can find really through experience is more knowing. I can just experience more, and that's what I do. That's what I, I does. There isn't an I, that's what I does. As a function, it's not somebody in there, this isn't a judgment about what should or shouldn't happen. It's just what I does as it goes, and it starts to seek. It seeks through money um, or different, any experience at all, and sometimes it goes to spirituality, and in spirituality, it's all to do about, you know, about me. All of it has to do about me. That's actually one of the core experiences of this arising need is the entire appearance is suddenly all about me. Um, now, the, the, the individual, the experience of separation is simultaneously also the appearance. So the message I think is in some way is unique in that it has no expectation, no demand, nothing on offer, and no need for anything to change. That's not the point of the message. The message is just simply a reflection to the experience that something needs to happen, to that experience of separation, that it doesn't. Nothing does need to happen. Not even the end of the experience of something needs to happen. That's not a problem. It's a problem for that experience, but it's not intrinsically a problem for the appearance because there isn't anything. So the appearance isn't like waiting for something to happen. It's not waiting to become like the experience of the separate individual has. I'm waiting for something to happen. I'm waiting to become. The appearance actually doesn't have any energy like that in it at all. It has no intention. Because, or 
as a result of, or the mirror reflection of that is, it's condition unconditionally free already. Whatever arises is unconditional freedom. So that even, it's even the experience that something needs to happen. Even the experience that I know I'm here and everything is out there and I'm trying to find something to make myself feel better, that's also unconditional freedom appearing as that need. And the message is simply a reflection back to that need which comes and seeks and it, uh, all the reflection is nothing needs to happen. There isn't anything to find. There actually isn't an individual. That what is, is already complete. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've made some notes based on different things I've heard you talk about in the past and I thought I would just throw some out and let you kind of yeah. look on them. All right. Um, you've used the term psychosomatic misunderstanding before. Yeah. Kind of an interesting yeah, I way. Don't, I don't say that too much anymore. It sounds a little um, psychological. Mm -hmm. um, and it's more profound than a misunderstanding. The, where I was coming from is at some point it might be seen by no one that the energy of separation is, arises out of a contracted energy in the body. And that then turns into, or out of that arises the need or knowing as a need. Need, funny, knowing isn't a satisfaction, or if it is, it's very short-lived, and then it demands more knowing, and that knowing arises the individual, and so that's a misunderstanding of the appearance. Nothing actually needs to be known, mm -hmm. and psychosomatic because it comes out of the contracted energy in the body. One of the things you've said in the past about when people ask you about the difference between you and them and their experience and you said there's no longer a need for things to be better or different yeah it's kind of i also say there isn't any difference mm -hmm. which i think is closer to the point yeah I've also talked about readiness some people seem to have a readiness to resonate with yeah um, yeah which isn't something we have any control over, but I, I wonder if the people you've heard from have had this sort of maybe exhausted seeker syndrome where they've been at this for a long time and become disillusioned and then all of a sudden this message resonates. Well, because because the the resonance doesn't have anything to do with the seeking energy. There are people who where where or bodies where the me falls away in the middle of meditation or in the middle of gambling. It doesn't really, it has no, or walking down the street, there's no real, there is no connection because it doesn't really happen. Mm -hmm. So there's no way to draw a line from an exhausted seeker to awakening. Makes sense. It doesn't happen because this is already what we're talking about mm -hmm. and the end of seeking isn't actually something that happens it's the revelation that there was never a real seeker so if you could say it's an unhappening but that's just mind fuck really because i'm just saying nothing happened it's the big that's really one of the one of the so one of the things that comes up when it when it's over is that nothing happened That was an interesting thing that came up listening to your talks was the recognition that all this apparent spiritual progress the trade characters made and all that stuff never happened. It's it oh, it apparently did. The, uh, the 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 your your history isn't yours, but it is an appearance. What's not is it being yours. Mm. That's the illusion. But there's an apparent history to this body that did all these things. It just doesn't belong to anyone. Yeah, that's one of the things you've talked about in the past. The only illusion is the sense of me, that it, this is yeah. to me. Yeah. And the rest is more an appearance. Well, it just is an appearance. Yeah. The difference is, is when there's when that when that separation, it happening to me. That happening to me is the experience that what's happening or the appearance is actually real. Mm -hmm. Time is real, space is real, 
and with that comes, as we talked already, a need that comes with the experience of meaning and purpose, the experience of free will and choice. And that's sort of a matrix of how to find the solution to my, to my um, predicament of what is this about? Who am I? What is life about? And how do I find the answers to it? Meaning and purpose and my free will and choice are sort of like the mechanisms that I use in order to get through my life and find what I feel the answer to those questions would be. Yeah, I've had glimpses of the space and time being an illusion as well, just listening to that and realizing that there's just, you talk about the um, perpendicular versus, there's not a continuum yeah. here. There's yeah. just this immediacy of what's arising. And it can appear as a continuum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The There's perpendicular, also... I just think it's interesting because the perpendicular, it's just a model and I know it falls down, but the perpendicular you could say is this. And the, what is that? Perpendicular and horizontal. horizontal? Yeah. Is then the experience of time is real. And so that's being crucified on the cross <laughs> is the experience of real time. That's my real time. Mm -hmm. okay. And there's a lot to do. There's a lot, the whole experience of real time and I'm real and my life is real is an experience of trying to work this out. Mm. And not only can it not be worked out, it doesn't need to be. It's funny, I was listening to one of your recent talks and this woman was asking some questions and um, really wanting to know what she can do and you telling her there's no you to do it. Um, and her like, this is a horrible message. And you said, yes, it is. There's nothing yeah. for you. <laughs> yeah. You said, and it's still hopeless. And she just yeah. started laughing hysterically because she kind of got it. It was, yeah. and it's a relief, you know, the hopelessness. Yeah. I don't have yeah. to wake up. I don't, I'm not doing this. It's just yeah. hope. Yeah. That's kind of cool. The hopelessness, you wouldn't think hopelessness would have a, a joyful feeling to it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, it's such a confinement. Hope is such a constraint mm -hmm. because it's never this. Hope is never this. Hope is always going to happen in the future. It's just a part of the function of that experience of separation of a better experience. Mm -hmm. That's hope, a better experience. What's next? Mm -hmm. That's that's what it is. And in a way, hopelessness is a little misleading. For the experience of separation, it's absolutely hopeless. But as the con with that this without context there is no need for hope or hopelessness mm -hmm. there they lose their relevance i think one of the more powerful words i've heard you use a number of times is already yeah That's, yeah of course yeah that really sinks in i think it's just a reminder that there's nothing that needs to happen. It's yeah. There's already no you. There's there's just right. what's rising, and mm. it's already. I love that word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think one of the things that people find hard to swallow is there's no meaning or purpose to any of this. But yeah, that's mainly because there's not a continuum. There's nothing leading to the next moment. Nothing led to this moment. And in effect, what's arising is, I don't want to say independent of past and future, but it's, it's just simply this. I like your website, simply this. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's actually not, not without past or future. It's, in, it's all included. So it, again, it's not going anywhere, but it includes the past and future. They're just not real. But I don't remember what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, that probably answers it. Um, oh, good. <laughs> yeah, I like that this message exposes the fallacy that there's an individual who can find freedom. That kind of yeah. gets back to the, what we were talking about. It's an exclusive thought. <clears throat> it's exclusivity. And, it's, and it's, it has to do with authority. 
I've done it and you haven't, I can find it and you can't. If you do it right, you'll find what I've found and I can tell you about it and then you'll be where I am, which is better than where you are. So, so freedom or unconditional love is exclusive then to those who have the ability, the knowing or the experience or whatever it is that's required to become what's expected, what, whatever, whatever, um, you know, is being, um, on, whatever's on offer. Mm -hmm. And this, this message points out that unconditional freedom or unconditional love couldn't possibly be exclusive. If it were, what value, what, what would the point be? I mean, it has no relevance anymore. Right. If it weren't already everything, then then only certain people would be able to find it. Certain people who are very good at concentrating, for example, or certain people who are very good at doing one thing or the other would be the only ones where the unconditionality of the freedom, and then it wouldn't be unconditional anymore, would it? It would be, it would be um, mm. personal because it wouldn't be this. It would be something which it requires an act to become. So it's mm. personal because the only thing that becomes is the individual. It's the only one that has the experience that time is a, con a real continuum instead of just an apparent, which has no real relevance. It just appears. For the individual, it has a, re a relevance, a real relevance. And a teaching or something like that says that, yes, it does. And that relevance is that you can, if you do the right things, if you behave in the right way or meditate or do whatever you're supposed to do enough, you will find the unconditional freedom. You will find enlightenment. It's a person. It's a. It's an idea of personal enlightenment. Yeah, that there is, is no good. such thing. Okay. All right. <laughs> that was one of my questions. That doing a lot of inquiry it occurred to me that inquiry leads to recognition. There's no I, but leaves intact the one who knows there's no I. Yeah. Yeah, you've talked. A lot of people ask you about meditation and different practices, and I believe the. The response is there's nothing right or wrong with any of that but if the intention is there in meditation to bring about a better experience the reminder is that you're just you're already it's already yeah. what you're seeking that's right yeah it's not <clears throat> it's not actually what's being sought the experience of separation seeks knowing like you like you said um self-inquiry is about knowing it's knowing the one who knows there's no one it's finding that position. So, so that's what seeking is about, is finding more, more knowing. Mm -hmm. And meditation intention doesn't change the fact that it's already unconditional. Mm -hmm. That is the difficulty. That is the dilemma for the experience of separation, is it feels like something needs to happen. And that experience of something needs to happen is exactly where the intentionlessness of the appearance hides. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things you've said in the past too is that the um, deep down people already know this. There's yeah. this is just permission in anyway, this message. Yeah. So, yeah. And you can tell people that don't want to hear it. They'll actually they'll actually just avoid it at every turn. Mm -hmm. Just just they don't want to hear it. I mean, nobody makes that choice, but you can just sense that because it is. If there's an openness, as you said, or a readiness, or um, which isn't a person's readiness or openness, nobody would ever choose this. It couldn't possibly be because it doesn't have anything on offer for the chooser. Mm. Um, but if there's that openness, it's just immediately obvious that what's being said is um, undeniable. That this, in the sense that this is already, and that it doesn't require any understanding, any action for it to be. One of the things you've said in the past, when the me drops away, it's almost unmentionable. Oh, it's not worth mentioning. Yeah. It's not worth mentioning. It's not, it, the, the end of individual, the experience of separation has something about, something in it about being special. And so it, it expects that the solution to its very complex problem itself is gonna be something special that will reflect its expectation because it's a really big issue. It's complex and complicated. It, it encompasses the entire world, including wars and famine and, and the earth and good eating and health and 
you know, which religion do I tune it, choose? It's all very complex. And so it expects that the end of that problem or the solution to that problem is going to is going to re be reflected in that complex, complicated, so world shattering sort of way. And really, the end of seeking is not worth mentioning. It's exactly the opposite in a way. It's the end of that that huge complication that I am revealing an absolute simplicity that, like we said just a second ago, is obvious. When there's an openness, it's, it's already obvious that this is already. Now that this is complete and whole is obvious, is, is not obvious if there's an experience of separation going, but it doesn't take much to see that that's a possibility, that this is complete and whole without anything needing to happen. Mm. Mm. Yeah, one of the analogies you've touched on in the past is the um, <clears throat> tree of knowledge, the Garden of Eden story. And yeah. How that gets you kicked out of paradise, it seems. Yeah. Relevant. Um, one of those old folklores that really, in a way, points to what, what I think we're talking about. Knowing. Oh, totally. Mm -hmm. Totally. Knowing. Well, that's what the story is, is that, you know, Eve eats from the tree of knowledge, a fruit. And, and then suddenly knowing arises, tree of knowledge, now they know. And they are kicked out of paradise and they have to put on clothes to hide their shame. That's just a reflection of knowing. Knowing is a, the experience of self-awareness, um, which with, with, with self-awareness comes the experience of good and bad and right and wrong and shame. And that is simply an illusion. No one is ever kicked out. This is already it. So no one ever gets kicked out of paradise. There is the experience of being kicked out of paradise. Loss, something needing to happen. One of the things you point out a lot is that you can't get closer to or further away yeah. from what is yeah. already. It's, yeah. No matter what a parent individual does whatever practices it does to get closer, they're not getting further away. It's no. It's just, yeah. Well, it's already all inclusive. And it's sort of what we were talking about before. It's not worth mentioning. Mm -hmm. So when the experience of separation falls away or stops, it doesn't actually fall away, it stops happening. It's revealed there wasn't anywhere to go. So nothing happened. So it's not worth mentioning. There's nothing to say about it. No one did anything. There's no authority here to tell anybody anything about anything because there's nothing to say. There's nowhere to go. There's nothing to find. It's the end of seeking, not the finding of a solution. Yeah, and I have a lot of gratitude for all the questioners because without them, you know, the message, there's no need for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's already no need, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, one of the things you sometimes say is, show me something else. Show me. I know. <laughs> That's just a mind fuck, you know? I'm just playing a little bit of a game because mm -hmm. it's sort of a mental thing. Mm -hmm. But people are so addicted to the experience that something really happened that mattered. And it affects this now. And it's separate. And it will turn into something in the future. And I'm the one that has to do all of that. And for that to hold true, you'd have to be able to, it would have to be, what, verifiable that there's a real past when this important thing happened that brought about the real now and the real future where it's going to become something. And that just, you can't do that because you can't show anything but what is. Yeah, one of the, um, one of the things you like to describe what is, is it's utter chaos. This is yeah anarchy this is yeah it doesn't have to be what it is it's yeah and the mind i guess puts it in order puts it in a context puts it in a framework right so it can yeah function but yeah the idea that there's a me in there is the illusion but the rest of it's just kind of apparently arising for no apparent well what i was well what what's what's being pointed to there is that nothing is actually fixed or knowable it's only in the experience of separation that the appearance seems fixed and knowable 
which chaos, anarchy, those words are very threatening to the individual because it, th it threatens exactly that experience that what is is knowable. And so the individual wants a planable, knowable, regulated life that it can, you know, that it can <clears throat> um, feel safe in. And pointing out the chaotic or the anarchic nature of the appearance already undermines or points out that that is actually illusory. And what happens, that is exactly what's being lost. So the fear of the, of the chaos is actually behind that is a longing for the need, no longer a need to overcome the chaos that is everything already. This, I just don't know how to say that this, this doesn't have a real context, a real fixed reality. And, and yeah, as all that's being pointed to is that um, it's not really chaos, but it, it is so unfixed, so unsubstantial, so ungraspable. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm pointing to with, with it being chaos. And it's chaos and order at the same time. What, you know, it's, what's being pointed to is that there isn't anything behind this. For the experience of the individual, there's an understanding which seems to be behind, or a knowing which seems behind, or a plan, or control, or a feeling of free will and choice, or meaning and purpose, or my belief system. They all seem to be within or behind the appearance, giving it the experience of solidity, making it seem like it's real in relation to me. And that is completely illusory. There isn't actually anything inside it or behind it. The appearance is all of it. There isn't anything hidden that needs to be found or understood, which the experience of separation says there is. It's already all this, that's it, period, stop, full stop. And in that, it doesn't have a continuum to be real in. Chaos, anarchy. And I like anarchy because I was an anarchist. I, that was a, a very dear to my, dear to my, that's part of the, what I would call my character is very much of an anarchist, punk rock. <laughs> Could it be said that everything that arises is just an energetic exchange or is that energetic exchange? Exchange? Mm -hmm. All right, maybe. Not important. <laughs> no, that's all right. I'm not sure what you mean by exchange. Sounds like something's really happening when you say exchange or that the energy becomes this. And those two things don't actually, that, that I wouldn't say those things. They don't seem to be the way that it seems here. So this actually doesn't become, and the energy that this is, isn't the energy becoming the computer screen. It is computer screening. So the appearance is actually no thing, thinging, or the infinite, finiting. It is not separate, it's the same thing. It's, it, it's just impossible to put into words because there's no way to take a word that would contain everything that appears because every word is everything at the same time. Yeah, one of the things that comes up is there's, there's no one talking to no one. So there's just words arising. Yeah. And theoretically someone, apparent someone listening, but there's not, None of that's separate. It's all just what's arising. Yes. Yeah. I like that this this message doesn't make concessions for the, the seeker. A lot of people want to know what they can do, but there's no concessions yeah. made with this message, like the concessions made by a lot of non dual teachers that they give out practices and things like that. <clears throat> yeah. Which should come with a warning label about, you know. <laughs> what you seek is already it's not this is not getting you closer to where you want to be but go ahead and do it <laughs> yeah well I, I i don't i mean no concessions there's it's not like an effort or a position that it doesn't give concessions there isn't anything to be done if if there were something to be done then what we're talking about would be personal it would depend upon a certain action, a certain happening for it to be. And that just isn't the case. So there isn't anything to offer. 
and there's no one to what, what is concession what's the adject adverb of concession concede with there's nothing there's no one to to make concessions with what's longed for is what is already and so you know at the same time you have to say that if there are things on offer if there is a prescription then there would be somebody offering that to someone else who's had the experience or has the experience that what's longed for is personal and can be found and is limited to certain activities or certain um, uh, uh, intentions. And that's just not the case. I know that this, um, when we look at the past, um, sort of irrelevant here, but I think I'm curious about whether or not encountering Tony Parsons and the message contributed in some way to the following way to me in the world of apparent causality. Yeah, apparently. You've also talked about how the individual can uh, achieve certain states of uh, yeah. higher consciousness, I am God, those types of things, but they're really not what's being pointed to with this message. No, no it's personal. Mm -hmm. It has to do with I am. It feels impersonal, I know that but it has to do with what I've achieved or what I can maintain or what I can hold on to. It has to do with my awareness and my intention. It has to do with me. So it's still part of the, the uh, illusion. Yeah, it is. I think it's also um, one of the things you point out to people when they're asking questions is you never did that because they're talking about a story that happened in the past. Yeah. And the answer is you never did that. And I think a lot of times I hear a pause in these yeah. questionnaires where there's, it's kind yeah. of thinking in. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> I think that comes up often when people are asking, when they sort of get a glimpse of what we're talking about, then the question comes up, well, what do I do next? Or how am I going to pay the bills? Or how am I going to go to work and get up in the morning and shave and all those things? And, and the response is that there is, you've, th nobody's ever done it. See, the experience is that there's someone in here who has been in control of what's happening, more or less. And so if there's no one, who's going to control what's going to happen? It'll turn into chaos or anarchy. <laughs> And the response is, is that nobody's ever done anything because there isn't anyone. You know, what's long, what's truly longed for, what's truly wanted is anarchy. The end of the confined experience of something needing to happen, something needing to be held together, controlled, secure. That's death. That's living death in a way. What's longed for is the expansiveness, the end of that need to know for something to happen, to be in control. That's what's longed for. And feared the most. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. A lot of warm and tingly energy here. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's just a beautiful message and I'm glad I can somehow be a part of possibly introducing others here tonight. yeah cool i don't really have any other questions I, I don't know that there's you just sum it up so well there's nothing that really... yeah i'm not very talkative you know yeah it's a very it's very simple mm -hmm. you know the message what we're talking about it's really incredibly simple it's not complicated it doesn't have to do with knowing anything or um some sort of intellectual you know, experience or, or um, activity. It's the simplicity of what is already. So simple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, oh, thank you, Ann. Thanks. Yeah, lots of love to you and gratitude. And I know you're not, <laughs> you're not responsible for the message. But, no, no. But it's funny. thank God. I know. <laughs> <laughs> 
be the worst thing in the world being a spiritual teacher. Just imagine. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs>